and welcome to the 2014 Judicial Candidates Forum for the San Francisco Superior Court Seat 20. This event is hosted by the Bar Association of San Francisco. My name is Yolanda Jackson. I am the Interim Executive Director of the Bar Association of San Francisco. We appreciate you all coming out this evening to hear from the three candidates for this seat. This event is being recorded by sfgov.tv and will be widely broadcast between now and the election. Election day is June 3rd. Remember to vote. BASF has a history of hosting judicial candidate forums and our purpose in doing so is to, for, to give you the opportunity to see your candidates face to face and to hear from the candidates on a variety of topics that are relevant to one serving as a judicial officer. So thank you all for being here this evening and we hope that you leave tonight more informed than when you arrived. Please allow me to introduce you to your moderator for this evening's forum. David Carrillo, also known as Dr. Carrillo, is the founding executive director of the California Constitution Center of Berkeley Law School. This center's efforts are devoted to developing scholarship concerning the California Constitution and the California Supreme Court. Dr. Carrillo received his doctorate from Berkeley Law with a dissertation focused on several areas of California constitutional law. Dr. Carrillo is also very well published in this area. Before going into academia full time, Dr. Carrillo was in active law practice for 16 years, including as a deputy attorney general with the Depart California Department of Justice, a deputy city attorney in San Francisco, and a deputy district attorney in Contra Costa County. Dr. Carrillo chairs the Judicial Appointments Committee of the Alameda County Bar Association and currently serves on the board of directors of the Justice and Diversity Center of the Bar Association of San Francisco, in addition to other board and committee work throughout the community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carrillo to the podium. Evening everyone and thank you for coming. Our candidates for Judicial C20 tonight are Daniel Flores, an attorney in private practice, Carol Kingsley, an attorney with a mediation and arbitration practice, and Kimberly Williams, a deputy district attorney here in San Francisco. I'll be your moderator. There are cards that we've passed out for you guys to ask questions at the end of the program uh, if we have time, uh, so please feel free to fill out the cards and uh, pass them along, and we'll do our best to get to them, again, time permitting. Um, one of the things that we're going to do tonight is uh, use some principles that have been developed by uh, a project of the League of Women Voters. It's called the Informed Voters Project. Uh, we are going to adopt some of their principles because I think they're relevant and because it's a project that I'm personally involved with. So in the next slide, and as a prelude to the first set of questions, we're going to see a set of principles that the Informed Voters Project has developed uh, to help members of the public and inform members of the public, like members of the bar, evaluate judicial candidates, because they're a very special kind of candidate. We depend on judges to stand apart from the political process and decide cases so based solely on facts and on the evidence, apart from political or partisan concerns. And so in evaluating a candidate, we, we, we have to evaluate a judicial candidate based on their character, their integrity, and their willingness to decide cases, despite, perhaps, the interests of powerful groups in our society. Judges should not be influenced by such special interests or fear losing their position due to deciding a case in a particular way. And so with that in mind, the Informed Voters Project has come up with these principles or characteristics of a judicial candidate to consider in evaluating them. And those are integrity, professional experience, judicial temperament, experience in the law and service. And that's the, gonna be the basis of the first set of questions that I'm gonna ask of our candidates. Uh, I will note uh, procedurally, I'm gonna go down the row in one direction, I'm gonna go down the row in the other direction. Uh, the candidates have an opportunity to make an opening statement. Uh, at the end of the program, we'll have the candidates do a closing statement. At that point, I'll go in a reverse direction. Um, candidates are gonna be timed in their responses and we have a, my colleague up here in the front who's gonna be showing them time cards to let them know uh, when, when their time is up for a particular question. Um, with that, and without further ado, I will turn to Mr. Flores. You have two minutes to make your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you all for your interest in San Francisco's judiciary and San Francisco's community at large. Uh, I am a native San Franciscan who's practicing here in San Francisco for the last 13 years. 
I began my career with Ropers, Majeski, Conan Bentley, where I handled many types of civil litigation with a heavy emphasis on personal injury and landlord-tenant law. In 2005, I opened up my own solo practice with a specific interest in becoming more accessible to members of our community. In 2007, I shut down that practice temporarily while I went to go volunteer at the Public Defender's Office full-time for four months. Uh, since then, I have been primarily a criminal defense lawyer, which has allowed me the opportunity to be in court on almost a daily basis, where I have seen some very uh, good decisions made by judges uh, and some that one can say maybe were not so good. I've seen the impacts that those decisions have made uh, on the lives of not only my clients, sometimes the victims' families, and different people who rely on our justice system uh, to get justice. And because of that, and because of those experiences, I have decided that I wanted to become a judge, and I communicated that to one of my mentors early on. I am very proud of what I've accomplished as a lawyer, and I would like to have this opportunity to accomplish much more than that for San Francisco as a judge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flores. And now, opening statement by Ms. Kingsley. Hello. I've lived and worked in San Francisco for over 32 years. I raised my son, who's 22, here as well. Unfortunately, when the city um, suffered its greatest gun shooting in history at 101 California Street in 1993, my family was particularly affected. My husband was one of the eight killed. Since then, I have worked hard to reduce gun violence in our community. I helped create a program that helped at-risk youth learn skills to de-escalate conflict and avoid violence in their lives. I served on the San Francisco Police Commission. I believe everybody in San Francisco should be safe in their lives. Life is a prerequisite for liberty and happiness. I have a joint degree, law degree, and an MBA, and have been a lawyer for 30 years. I've helped, I've been in private practice helping individuals and businesses on a broad range of civil matters. But what makes me unique as a candidate for Superior Court Judge is the fact that I have over 10 years of experience as a neutral mediator and a hearing officer. I have hundreds of hours of training and over 10 years of experience using essentially the same skills required of a judge. I have helped settle hundreds of cases, litigation cases, uh, in disputes successfully. As a police commissioner, I heard trial-like, um, I, I conducted uh, trial-like hearings and decided serious police discipline cases. I wish to bring that broad experience to the bench and to, of service to the San Francisco Superior Court. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. Ms. Williams, your opening statement, please. Good evening. My name is Kimberly Tony Williams. I'm a native San Franciscan. I graduated from Mercy High School. I obtained my Bachelor of Science in Public Administration from the University of Southern California. I also hold a Juris Doctorate from the University of California, Los Angeles. I have served as an Assistant District Attorney with the City and County of San Francisco since 1995. I led the implementation of the San Francisco's Community Justice Center to help those who commit low-level offenses find a path towards stability and self-sufficiency. Prior to my city service, I held a position with the Enforcement Division of the Securities and Exchange Commission where I focused on civil, excuse me, civic protection of the public. I am running for Superior Court Judge because we need a new voice of and from the people. You may have seen or heard my tagline, experience, equality, and integrity. These core qualities and traits would shape my decisions as judge, helping me to bring accessibility, assistance, and adaptability to the courtroom. More and more in recent years, the courts have suffered due to severe cutbacks in the budget. People of color, as well as those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, are the primary victims of this reality. Throughout my two decades as an attorney, I have honed the skills necessary to provide the people of San Francisco with excellent judicial service. 
to help increase the accessibility of our justice system. Expediency of cases and ensuring individuals are granted due process is not just a courtesy, it's the law. I have worked diligently as a prosecutor to safeguard each person's right and expectation of assistance from our justice system. I have a fiduciary duty to our legal system and the people I serve to ensure openness as well as exploring mediation and employing rem excuse me, remedial tools as necessary prior to trial. I Ms. believe Williams, I'm afraid I must cut you off there thank you. in the interest of fairness. But since we're going in reverse order for the first set of questions, I'm going to turn to you okay. first. Uh, in the introduction, I mentioned that uh, my feeling is and the Informed Voters Project's feeling is that there are unique qualities or characteristics of judicial candidates that you have to consider that are unique and special apart from an ordinary political candidate. Judges are, after all, held to a particular standard in our society and they form a particular role in our courts. So with that in mind, Informed Voters Project has come up with these unique characteristics for judicial candidates for you to consider in evaluating a candidate. Those are integrity, defined as being honest, upright, and committed to the rule of law, professional competence, a keen intellect, extensive legal knowledge, and strong writing skills, having a judicial temperament, being neutral, decisive, respectful, and composed, good professional experience, a strong record of professional experience in the law, and service, being committed to public service and the administration of justice. And so, Ms. Williams, the question to you first is, explain how you have demonstrated these qualities. Okay. That's a lot. With regard to integrity, as I noted, one of the core traits I believe that any juror should have that I possess is integrity. And as a prosecutor, it is my job uh, to determine and to ascertain what is just and fair, not just for the people of the city and county of San Francisco or the state of California, but also by way of treating the defendant with care and concern and making certain that the public is safe. With regard to competence, I have executed the skill set for over 19 years as a prosecutor with the city and county of San Francisco serving public interest. Uh, I have honed my skills in appellate and litigation work and continue to do so as well as service, service to my community. I have been a member of the board of directors for the IRIS Center, a women's mental health project, because as I noted during my practice, many people come before the court requiring uh, assistance and I think there needs to be uh, some address as to how we can adapt as a court and address needs not only of the victim but of the defendant. And I think that is quite important and I think those are the qualifications of a competent jurist. Do you feel that you've done anything in your career that demonstrates a judicial temperament in particular? I think every day the uh, job of a prosecutor is to determine what's fair and what's just and how cases are charged and I have to make decisions as to how cases are charged, how they are resolved, and how we go about speaking with the victim as well as the defendant to determine what is the best course of action not only for the safety of the community and that of the victim but to make certain that justice is served. Thank you and your time has almost expired and so I will move on to Ms. Kingsley and pose to you the same question. Explain to us how you have demonstrated in your life, in your career, these qualities that I mentioned, integrity, competence, judicial temperament, professional experience, and service to the community. Thank you. Integrity. I have consistently worked uh, as a officer of the court in providing um, assistance in the community on matters that I think are, are important and using my skills as a lawyer um, and knowledge of the law and experience in the law to do that and have stayed with that. While on the Ethics Commission, we felt that the public uh, felt it was important to have partial public financing and we went to the mat on that and brought it to the Board of Supervisors when it didn't fail, brought it to the voters and, and got it passed. Um, this, is, this is one example of staying with things for over 20 years. I felt it was important to um, work for reduction of gun violence. I already uh, went through that. Um, despite the uh, potential um, uh, repercussions that that sometimes may, may entail in terms, uh, in terms of taking on large, um, uh, large other public interests. Um, temperament. I have already conducted trial-like hearings. I have already maintained the decorum of a courtroom. I've already um, 
incompetence, this, this overlaps. In addition to my, thir well, as part of my 30 years of experience, 20 of it has been as an advocate attorney representing clients. The other 30, uh, or the other 10 years has been sitting in a judge-like sense and mediating cases, bringing them to conclusion. And I think that that, and, and successfully um, uh, resolving cases in litigation. I think that that addresses uh, competency. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. And Mr. Flores, uh, same question to you. How in your career and in your life have you demonstrated these qualities, integrity, competence, judicial temperament, experience, and service to the community? Thank you. I'd first start off by saying that uh, integrity and demeanor are two of the things that have been pointed out consistently by the 27 judges that have endorsed my candidacy. Um, it seems to me that uh, what I learned in the Marine Corps uh, has stuck with me, and I have uh, been able to demonstrate that in court under some of the most trying uh, of moments. Um, with respect to experience, uh, we have three courthouses in San Francisco. Uh, the juvenile court, the civil court, and the criminal court, I have practiced in all three. Uh, with respect to service, um, I have been a member of the San Francisco La Raza Lawyers Association ever since I moved back to San Francisco in 2001. I'm currently on my fourth term on the board. Um, as mentioned earlier, I have volunteered here in San Francisco for four months straight. Um, I have also taken pro bono matters, uh, including a trial in 2012, uh, which I did for free. And uh, I'll lastly say that all of these characteristics are included in uh, what is part of the decision-making process uh, by the Thomson Reuters publication called the Northern California Super Lawyers Magazine. Uh, in 2009, 2010, and 2011, um, I earned their designation of rising star, and in 2013, I earned their designation as a super lawyer. Um, so these things have already uh, been vetted, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to tell you about it more here. Thank I think you. you have about 30 seconds left. The one of the categories that you did not address is judicial temperament. And I yes. realize it's both the most vague and the most difficult to demonstrate, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, I, I see that a lot as being a part of uh, d demeanor. Uh, one thing that I think I've demonstrated is patience. When you deal with clients and you have to explain to them, uh, sometimes in uh, very uh, heated, animated uh, conversations, uh, what the outcome of their case may be especially when it's not what they want to hear, and there's no magic potion to give them a better result, uh, but you're giving them the advice that they need to hear. Um, it's Mr. Flores, your time has expired. Thank you. But the next question does go to you. Okay. And question two is, how do you define the role of a trial court judge in San Francisco? And I emphasize those parts of the sentence because I think it really is a question in two parts. A trial judge in particular is distinct from one of the various levels of appellate judge, and a trial judge sitting in San Francisco to the extent that you feel that that's unique. So how do you define the role of a trial judge in San Francisco? Thank you. I do think it's unique in San Francisco in the sense that we do not have single assignment uh, positions. Uh, so most of the time, uh, with the absence of maybe complex civil litigation, um, the judges will receive the parties and the case for the very first time when they come in. Um, I believe that the role of a trial court judge begins with um, how that judge treats uh, his or her staff, uh, the environment that is created uh, in the courtroom uh, that then flows to the parties and how they submit their briefs, the attention that is given to those briefs, uh, the expectations uh, that are uh, tactfully communicated to the parties on how that particular courtroom is going to be handled and what is going to be acceptable and what is not going to be acceptable. Uh, then it flows to the jury and uh, being conscientious uh, and respectful of their time as well. Um, and I think that um, in San Francisco we enjoy a bench that includes uh, many fine judges that have uh, really honed in those skills uh, and created an environment where uh, the trial court judge um, gets to a certain degree, watch the parties in action, and um, have them fight out their case and rule on the objections and the admissibility of evidence as it um, goes on in the trial. You have a few seconds left. If you could analogize the role of a trial judge in San Francisco to something else, could you? 
I think the role of a judge is very unique. Uh, at, at the moment, I can't think of a proper analogy. Very well. We'll move on then. To you, Ms. Kingsley, same question. How do you define the role of a trial court judge in San Francisco in particular, to the extent that you feel it's unique? And feel free to explain to us why you think it is or is not. OK, thank you. The, the, um, some of the words of Justice Sotomayor comes to mind. I read her book, My Beloved World. And she d makes a distinction between the three uh, various levels of court. And uh, she, she talks about at the trial level, you're dealing with facts and precedent, as opposed to the appellate level <coughs> when you're dealing more theoretically. And then, of course, at the Supreme Court, uh, the finality of it. And uh, that comes to mind because at the trial level, you really are dealing with people and facts and precedent that has, has gone before you. And, 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 and I think that that is, you know, that's an important um, focus as opposed to, for example, another form, which are the police hearings that I conducted. Same trial-like setting, you conduct a hearing, you receive the evidence, and you hear from the parties, but it's a little different. There's a different framework in terms of a discrete um, uh, body of law, the Department of General Orders and, and so on, of the department as opposed to uh, the broad uh, law in, in, in uh, the state that, that we're working with. In San Francisco in particular, because we have such a rich and diverse uh, culture, I think access is, um, and access to the various types of courts is very important, having interpreter services uh, to support that and, and understanding the diverse cultures. And we have also very unique um, different services within our court. In addition to the civil and criminal, we have the probate and family court, and we've got a number of other, you know, community justice court, and more recently, as part of that, the Veterans uh, Justice Center, and um, restorative justice within the criminal um, court set, uh, s the court setting, and that is quite unique to San Francisco, having all of those other kind of alternative um, departments or branches, if you will. They're not really branches, but time is up. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. I was just about to do that. Uh, Ms. Williams, same question to you. How do you define the role of a trial judge as distinct from an appellate judge, and how about in San Francisco to the extent that you think that that's unique? I don't think it's unique to San Francisco. I think as a trial judge, one must realize that the parties uh, come before the court wishing to be heard, and to be heard simply and clearly and with fairness and integrity and fidelity to the law. <clears throat> Uh, I think it's incumbent on the trial court judge to realize that this is a place of last resort um, and to truly understand the motivations and the issues of the trial court, whether that be by brief or by argument of the parties. Uh, it's incumbent on the trial judge to establish rules of decorum for the court as to how the parties are to treat each other as well as the staff and, if present, a jury, and what the expectation is of the court in dealing with these matters. Uh, I think it's also very important for the court to the extent possible to employ remediation measures uh, to resolve matters prior to going to trial, uh, understanding that the court is under severe budget cuts and uh, has an interest in expediting justice with a sense of fairness and integrity. But be that as it may, if the trial were to go forward, uh, I think that most parties all parties, all litigants that come before the court, whether in a criminal or civil context, wish to be heard and know that the court has addressed their issues fully and fairly. You mentioned at uh, the beginning of your answer, and there's a, a little bit of time left here, that uh, you felt that being a trial judge in San Francisco is the same as being a trial judge anywhere else. Would you like to expand on that? Just that I think that anywhere one goes, that integrity, fairness, uh, judicial temperament, and listening to the parties is important. I don't think that it sets itself apart whether we're in San Mateo County or Marin County. People want fairness, and that's why they're coming to the court, because it is the place of last resort. Very good. And now question three is to you, as we reverse ourselves again going back down the line. Question three is, uh, and it perhaps <coughs> relates to something that you just mentioned uh, in your answer, what do you see as the greatest challenge facing San Francisco Superior Court right now? And if you are elected, what could you, as a trial court judge, do about it? Uh, 
I think in the late 2000s, 2008, 2009, uh, one of the most dire consequences of the budget shortfalls for this California were the cuts to the court. Uh, I think that was devastating. Court staff has been cut, interpreters have been cut, and in a sense, the windows have been closed to justice for many who seek it, and only those who have the wherewithal and financial resources uh, can gain access. So I think, one, we need to look at accessibility of the courts for those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, but I also think the court needs to look at adaptability. How are we addressing the matters that are before us? Whether it's in a criminal context, would it be better to have programs where the judiciary can be uh, the originators of some of the programs in an effort to take some of the stress off of the trial courts uh, by way of criminal activity, or uh, in the matter of civil cases, how can we employ as a judici judiciary uh, remediation efforts such as uh, discussing the case and come to some uh, detente before a trial is required? And I think that's quite important. Uh, and I think with uh, assistance, how do we assist those who come before the court who may not be able to afford a lawyer? Many of those things have been gone by the wayside in light of the budget cuts. As you are aware, the judiciary uh, is the only branch of the government that relies on the other two for funding. And I, as a jurist, will do anything that uh, is required and support Supreme Court Justice Tani Cantil Sakaue and whatever necessary message Excuse me, mechanism to get more money from the governor to uh, address these matters in the 58 counties. Thank you. I see your time is about to run out, Thank but I, I will pause to commend you on pronouncing the chief's name correctly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now to you, Ms. Kingsley. Um, same question to you. Uh, what do you see as being the greatest challenge facing San Francisco Superior right now, and what could you, as a trial judge, if you were elected, do about it? I think there's no doubt that the financial crisis that the court is under right now is the greatest challenge. It affects everything with the court. It affects the support uh, because of cutback in uh, staffing. It affects getting documents filed. It, it, it affects uh, the service to the public in terms of um, elderly people needing to wait far, far longer to have their needs addressed in terms of care, and children having to wait far longer than they should have for services in terms of stability in their lives and placement in foster care. These kinds of things, cases, civil cases are hit the hardest in the court from, uh, from what I've read in terms of uh, the new reality, the uh, Superior Court in uh, 2014. And the length of time that it takes to get um, civil cases now uh, to trial is, is, has become um, elongated. So I think that money in terms of adding uh, more judges, adding more staff will help. Also the electronic filing will help, which is already in process at the courts. Uh, what I can do, uh, first of all, I'm going to work very hard, and I have 30 years of experience, both as an advocate and as a hearing officer mediator, and so I will be able to bring that experience and work efficiently. The other thing is that I would work as a team with the priority set by the presiding judge to fix the problems that they've already identified and the last is bring more alternative dispute resolution components into the court. Bring back the mediators into the small claims for people who are self-represented. Bring back early settlement uh, mediations as part of the, of the uh, court services. Um, Ms. Kingsley, I'm afraid I must cut you off. Thank you. I That's apologize. Fine. And Mr. Flores, same question to you. You get the final word on this one. Uh, if elected, what could you do as a trial court judge to address whatever you see as the most serious problem facing San Francisco Superior Court today? Uh, thank you. So with respect to what the problem is, I fully agree with my uh, two opponents here as to the budget, uh, budget crisis and budget cuts uh, being uh, the biggest problem we face. Um, what I would bring to the table to address the many issues that they've brought up is um, not only hard work and, and efficiency. Um, I've also practiced in the federal system, which I think operates 
uh, in a much more efficient manner. There's uh, a lot more uh, that goes on via electronic means. Um, I don't know exactly what it is that has stopped uh, San Francisco Superior Court or the Superior Court of California in general uh, from uh, gaining that same speed, uh, but I would definitely look towards that as a positive example to see what we can implement here in San Francisco uh, to make things more efficient. Uh, as someone who's represented individuals in San Francisco and made it a point to represent individuals, um, I not only see the problems with the system, but I also see that the poor people in our community are the ones that are mostly affected by these budget cuts. Um, I, for one, have had to bring my legal assistant into court with me to act as an interpreter uh, in, in domestic violence-related restraining order cases where my client simply wanted protection from her ex-husband, and we're in a situation where uh, my client's undocumented and all of her family's undocumented, and I'm trying to ask my client to see whether or not she can bring someone from her family to serve as an interpreter, and we just didn't have it. And I know that that particular budget cut has now changed or is in the process of changing, uh, but it's a huge problem. And uh, as someone who graduated college at 21 and graduated law school at 24 uh, and has operated my career in a very efficient manner, um, I know there's something I can do to help. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Before I turn again to you and reverse direction for the next set of questions, I do want to remind the members of the audience, especially if you've just walked in, that there are uh, cards and writing implements on the tables. If you want to inscribe any questions for the candidates and pass them to a member of the staff, they'll make their way to me. Uh, and time permitting, at the end of the program, uh, we will try to get to some of your questions. So please feel free to write down your thoughts and submit them, and we'll do our best to get to them. So now, coming to Mr. Flores for question four, uh, a topic close and near and dear to every practicing trial attorney's mind. How do you think that contentious tr discovery disputes should be handled? Well, first I think that with respect to what judges can do in particular is uh, create an environment where uh, discovery disputes uh, should be treated as something, first of all, that is legitimate. And uh, we should start from a standpoint that there is some legitimacy behind there being a dispute and respect the fact that the lawyers are fighting about something. And then also create the opportunity for the lawyers to explain whether or not the dispute is legitimate. And then act swiftly to uh, create an environment that uh, makes it clear that disputes that are in existence simply to stall the other side or to overburden the other side or come as a result of gamesmanship uh, should have their consequences. That would be, as someone who practiced in civil uh, litigation um, and has seen how difficult it is to achieve justice on behalf of a client when someone who has a lot more money than you uh, is able to put a lot of obstacles before you, um, that is something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. I've experienced it firsthand, and um, I think it's a huge problem. It is something that adds to our uh, backlog. Uh, because judges and our courts have to find a way to deal with that. And in San Francisco, uh, uh, unfortunately, sometimes, in my own experience, I've had longer hearings about discovery disputes uh, than I've had uh, with substantive matters that pertain to my client's liberty uh, or their ability to exercise their profession moving forward. You have about 30 seconds left. Um, do you want to make any comment, or do you feel you can make any comment on the appropriateness of levying sanctions, particularly monetary sanctions? I, I think that there um, is definitely opportunities and uh, circumstances where monetary sanctions are extremely appropriate and would do a lot of good uh, for our legal community so that lawyers know that gamesmanship will not be tolerated. Thank you, Mr. Flores, uh, and that's just in time. Uh, Ms. Kingsley, we turn to you with the same question. How do you feel that contentious discovery disputes should be handled? How would you handle them if you were elected? Um, first, and, and this is um, uh, perhaps a, a not a direct answer, perhaps a little more indirect, is um, aside from handling them myself as a judge, I think that discovery disputes in particular lend themselves very well to mediation. And I know that there presently are uh, discovery masters, people that handle this, but um, they're, they're, I think that that process can be um, made a little more uh, accessible 
and if applied early on, that can avoid a lot of the disputes around discovery that arise later. Although I think applying mediation type of skills and, and, and approach would work best started early in a case at any point in the case when discovery gets bogged down, I think that uh, mediation would be a uh, very helpful tool uh, to use. Um, in terms of my uh, approaching it from the bench as the judge on the case, I would encourage uh, lawyers to take the time out. I would work with them initially to see if we can't reach some parameters around the entire case and the discovery in the entire case rather than um, just on various motions that are made along the way. And failing that, um, if, if, if it still seemed um, uh, out of hand, so to speak, I would encourage them to go into private mediation for uh, those matters. So um, there is that, and in terms of monetary sanctions that was suggested, there are times that that is appropriate, and I would apply the rules in uh, when appropriate. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley, again, just in time. And Ms. Williams, same question to you. How do you feel the contentious discovery dispute should be handled? Well, as a jurist, I would like to know sooner rather than later uh, if there is to be uh, an issue with discovery so that it may be remediated. Uh, prior to it becoming a full-blown issue. Uh, however, if it should become a full-blown issue, uh, the matters may be briefed, whether uh, orally or in writing, which would assist the court in making a determination as to uh, how to follow the law and which way to turn. I think oftentimes there is a misunderstanding, and I think that's where the court can come into play uh, by listening to the parties and determining what's at stake legally as well as technically speaking. Uh, in criminal cases, we are guided by the penal code as to when discovery is appropriate and how it is appropriate, and I think that is a great benchmark for the court to use, as well as the code of civil procedure as it relates uh, to civil matters. So in many instances, uh, the matters may be handled rather expeditiously. Uh, as for consequences, there are many that may be employed, whether that be sanctions or the denial of evidence uh, used at trial. Uh, may also be a sanction uh, to be meted by the court. You know, there's a, a few seconds left here, and so I wanted to follow up and ask something that's uh, particular to you based on your experience. As, uh, as a criminal prosecutor, I would think that monetary sanctions would be far less common than for your colleagues who practice in the civil world. Do you have any feeling in general about monetary sanctions if you were to handle a civil case? No, I think that that is one way to go about it. I also think denial of the use of evidence, whatever is at issue, uh, if a party is found to be at fault, uh, may hurt far more than monetary sanctions. Uh, so it really would depend on the circumstances giving rise to the sanction that is meted out by the court. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mm -hmm. And I will turn again to you as we reverse direction once again for question five, uh, which is describe for us your judicial philosophy. You, you do have to realize I work at a law school, so I, know. I have to get one academic question. I understand that, and I'm going to go by way of a story. Uh, when I was an undergraduate in a time in life, I thought I was going to be a physician. And during that time, uh, I followed a physician around uh, an orthopedist, uh, Dr. Stephen Conrad, and I asked him, what's the worst part of your job? And he said, as an orthopedist, everyone comes to me in pain. Everything is broken, strained, snapped. And I am seeing people quite often at their worst, and they're asking me to fix it. I think as a prosecutor and someone who has been involved uh, in not only the criminal justice system, but also in the civil courts for 20 years, I have realized that everyone that crosses the threshold of 400 McAllister, uh, juvenile, or uh, 850 Bryant is coming there in some form of pain, whether that be the defendant, the victim, their families, their supporters, or the community at large. And I think it is incumbent upon a jurist to 
understand that and try to resolve the matter as expeditiously as possible. I'm not so foolhardy to believe that everyone will agree with my decisions, but I do believe at the end of the day that they will believe that I've listened with fairness and integrity and a excuse me, fidelity to the rules and principles of law. And I think that is what they wish most of all is to be heard and understood. There's about 30 seconds left. If you could think of one bench officer, living or dead, that you could compare yourself to. I think there's many. I think we steal from everybody that we see, at least I hope to, uh, on some in terms of how they run their courts. Uh, I like uh, Judge Bouillon as to how she handles uh, the jury, how she selects the jury. The jury feels welcomed. They understand their importance. I like Judge uh, Terry L. Jackson because uh, she lets the parties know what's expected of them as soon as they walk in the door and how to handle themselves. Uh, I like Judge Garrett Wong in the matter because he handles a lot of mental health issues and how he deals with the defendants and discussing their problems and how they can garner a path towards stability. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And to Ms. Kingsley, describe for us your judicial philosophy. I think when people come to the courts, what they want most is to be heard. They want to be confident that they've been heard uh, entirely and uh, they want evidence of that. They're looking for fairness. They want to make sure that the process has been fair to them. They want to make sure that the uh, uh, judge in the case is maintaining the appropriate decorum in the courtroom so they feel safe in the courtroom. Confidence in the process is of primary importance. Trust, trusting the process, trusting that their case has been um, treated and handled appropriately and again um, being heard. And of utmost importance that the law has been followed. And that above everything else being heard and the fact that the law has been followed will create confidence in the court system and satisfaction with services. And there's about 30 seconds left. If you could think of a judicial officer, living or dead, that you would compare yourself to? I'm, I, I am hesitant because I don't feel that, uh, I feel that I would be arrogant in some ways to compare myself to somebody who, well, who I mean in the sense of who would you try to emulate? Emulate. Uh, that, is, that, is an, that is a much more easy um, one in that um, I think that there are so many uh, fine judges on the court, um, both at the, um, in, in the city of San Francisco in the Superior Court, it's almost like which children, which child do you love the most? Um, we have um, such a wonderful bench with, with truly um, very special uh, judges. And I must say, though, that um, on the, um, uh, superior, the, the California Supreme Court, our Chief Justice impresses me the most. Her background, her demeanor, what she has done for the courts in California. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. And Mr. Flores, on this one, you get the last word. Describe for us your judicial philosophy. Uh, thank you. So I want to start with a little perspective. I'm, I'm the son of immigrants that came from El Salvador, and uh, they came to achieve the American dream. Uh, for me, being a lawyer has always been a great privilege to serve people. Um, it, it is something that is, in many ways, uh, very humbling to have that honor of having someone come to your office and uh, entrust you with their most vulnerable moment in their life. Uh, some of the most difficult times that they might ever face and say, you're the person I want uh, to, help you, to help me, to help me see through this. Uh, as a judge, my philosophy would be to never lose sight of the fact that I would be there to serve if I'm honored with the position. I'm here to serve uh, not any particular interest, not any particular side, but to serve the interest of San Franciscans, uh, to try to achieve the best result, uh, whether it be something that is uh, geared towards keeping our community safe, uh, getting the right result for a small business owner who's uh, potentially maybe not getting paid on an invoice that uh, he or she needs to keep their business alive. Um, that is the type of perspective that I would always want to keep in mind. 
Uh, when it comes to certain more specific philosophies, uh, my philosophy would be one to allow the lawyers a full and fair opportunity to argue their case because they know their case best. Um, and that applies to all aspects of the case as much as I would be able to do it. Uh, I once had a, an opportunity to try a case in front of a judge uh, who lectured the jury uh, about the civil rights movement and everything else that completely muted them. And when it came time for me to ask them questions, uh, they wouldn't dare say anything that might offend a judge. Um, I really resented that, and I felt that that hindered my ability as a trial lawyer to select a, a, a fair and impartial jury. Um, so that's the type of thing that I would not include in my philosophy. <laughs> I would hope none of us would. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Uh, and reversing direction for the last time, uh, unless I have time to get to one more question. Uh, Mr. Flores, um, I realize I may be stealing a little bit of your thunder from your planned closing, but uh, tell us, please, why you are the best candidate. Thank you. Uh, I stand here, well, I sit here before you as the only candidate that has substantial civil and criminal litigation experience. Um, that makes me more ready to hit the ground running to serve our community than either of my two opponents. I say that with, with respect to the background that they bring. Um, but my background is one of representing what is mostly seen in our courts. And these are individuals. These are people who do not want to be in court, that have problems that have not been resolved in any other way. And I've been with my clients from start to finish, through the good and the bad, through the selection of experts, through the constant contacting my clients to see if they have enough funding to hire experts. And all of this perspective is one that my two, can my two other candidates uh, in this race uh, simply have not experienced in their career, um, and I have. I also have the experience as a small business owner here in San Francisco, having to deal with overhead and making payroll and that type of thing. I have also demonstrated throughout my career that I have approached my career as one of service. When I was 29 years old and opened up my practice, one of the first cases I got was a $1.5 million settlement. The very next thing I did was shut down my practice and volunteer at the public defender's office. Why? Because my overarching uh, motivation in this is to be a good member of my community, to serve the community, uh, and that's why I think I'm the best candidate for the position. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Thank Ms. You. Kingsley, why do you feel that you are the best candidate for this position? I think there are two things around my background that stand out in particular. The overall uh, amount of experience that I have, both legally and personally and in public service. Legally, I have 30 years of experience in the law, 20 years as an advocate um, in the civil area. I have a very broad range, the broadest range of civil um, experience. I've handled um, business formations, contracts, um, wills and trusts, construction, real estate matters, uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, employment, securities, tax, um, though a very, very wide range of civil matters. My uh, service to the public in, in that realm, which I will include and reserve for my closing, uh, is, is very extensive. My personal experience, both as a single mom uh, raising a child to adulthood, uh, my experience as experiencing the criminal, uh, the victim side of, of crime, as well as the law enforcement uh, side, I think that that brings a richness um, to my experience uh, to the bench. Um, there's a certain amount of wisdom that comes with having to make decisions, sitting in the seat, making decisions after you hear evidence. And as a hearing officer with the police commission, I have years of experience doing that. I also have years of experience as a mediator, listening again to talented advocate lawyers on either side, making their case, presenting their evidence, and helping them reach a conclusion and resolving that conflict. I, and I believe it's the composite of all of those experiences that make me the best choice. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. And Ms. Williams, why do you feel that you are the best qualified candidate? Yes, I think there's several reasons. One, uh, 
I have service in a civil context as well as a criminal context. By way of civil, uh, I held positions not only with the Securities and Exchange Commission, but also with Wells Fargo Bank. And I think it's important to note that in those two capacities, one, I was working in corporate transactions, the other, uh, general litigation as it referred to uh, the civil, excuse me, Securities and Exchange uh, position. Unlike my uh, opponents, I have over 50 jury trials and bench trials within the city and county of San Francisco, which I think makes me uniquely qualified for the last 19 years. For the most part, I have been in court every single day. I understand the process and procedure of how the courts are run, how they uh, are handled, and I think that sets me apart from my colleagues. Uh, I understand what it is to make decisions that impinge on life and death. Uh, as a prosecutor, I am charged with the mandate of charging cases, and I have to do that repeatedly. And I do that in mind with public safety, and I think that is something that I would maintain as a jurist, how to make decisions and understanding the consequences of those decisions. By way of personal narrative, uh, as I get older and as I have held my job longer, I think I understand what it takes to transition from one role to another. As I noted that I also have uh, appellate experience which sets me apart from my colleagues that I've been on the writs and appeals team of my office, representing my office, when rulings have been adverse to the superior court or the district court as appropriate. Uh, I also have experience and expertise in the area of policy as I have often, uh, on behalf of my office, written the policy decisions as it relates to uh, programs of remediation. And Ms. Williams, thank you. Uh, remind me if you would, did you go first or last on opening? I went, good grief. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope one of you remembers. I went last, I went last. You went last, thank all right. You. Then you're gonna go first okay. on opening, but first, yes. uh, you actually anticipated my next final lightning round question in your answer. You told us that you had tried 50 jury trials? Between bench and jury, yes. Combined? That's combined. a combined number. Miss mm -hmm. um, Kingsley, how many trials, and I want the answer in the form of a number, and it can be combined jury and court. I would say as a hearing officer, I've tried about 12. No, as an advocate. As an advocate, I haven't. How about as a hearing officer? As a hearing officer, around 12 and decision uh, make, helping make the decision on, on cases about 95. Very good. And Mr. Flores? 15. 15? 15, 15, one, one five. One five. Yes. And is that split between jury and court? Uh, it is. What's and, the division? And also uh, 10 uh, jury, five court, uh, three civil, the rest criminal. Very good. Thank you. Closing statements. Two minutes each. You stole my thunder on the last question, <laughs> so it's kind of hard. But again, as that I, was my intention. Oh, thank you. Uh, as I noted, I believe as a person, the three uh, traits or characteristics that I have uh, that will be of great assistance to me on the bench are experience, integrity, and equality. And as I note in quality, I think the court needs to be uh, more inclusive, and I don't mean only by way of gender or by uh, characteristics that are seen on the outside, such as color. Uh, what I mean by inclusive is that there needs to be a variety of voices among the bench officers, uh, that we cannot be uh, simply uh, speak with one voice to understand that people have uh, a variety of backgrounds and experiences that they bring to judicial uh, to the judiciary, uh, although they listen with fidelity to the law as they listen to cases, but they also bring personal experiences. Uh, I think that the court is at a crossroads in many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, by way of platform, as a jurist, what I would like to look at is how is the court accessible, or is it as accessible as it can be for the population that we serve, which are the citizens and people of California? Uh, what can we do by way of judiciary to assist those who require our services, and is the court uh, adaptable? I think over the last 20 years, we've seen many things change by way of sentencing and how we handle matters, but I think that the court, to some extent, uh, can be more proactive and should be more proactive in an effort to attain justice for all. I think you are just about out of time. Thank you. So we'll turn to Ms. Kingsley. Your two minute closing, please. 
I firmly believe that all people deserve high quality legal and judicial services. While I was practicing in private practice, I volunteered with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights on their legal services for entrepreneurs and helped low-income people form small businesses and uh, nonprofits. As separate from my uh, private mediation practice, I also have mediated many cases in litigation for low or no cost. I've trained and mentored other mediators. As president of the San Francisco Women Lawyers Alliance, I helped bring the first children's waiting room into the Hall of Justice. It was the first in the Superior Court, so that children would have a safe and appropriate place to stay while their parents or their caregivers had business with the courts. Most candidates for Superior Court are trial judges, but the world is changing. 90% 90, 90 or more of the cases that are filed in litigation don't go to trial. A large portion of these cases settle. Many judges, when they retire, they take the experience that they have on the bench into private practice as alternative dispute people. I seek to do the opposite. I want to take my 10 years of experience as a mediator and 20 years as an advocate, use those skills for public service, serving the people of San Francisco, assisting our financially strapped uh, superior court to deliver the finest, best services possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley. Mr. Flores, two minutes. Thank you. What San Francisco has right now is an opportunity to have input on who is going to be the next judge in San Francisco. It is a very rare opportunity, as we know. Um, I am not running for election because I think I'm the smartest person in the world. I am not running for election because I think I'm the most experienced person in the world. I am running for election to judge because I believe that I have the right character the right decision-making ability, and that my experience and what I've accomplished in 13 years speaks for itself. I would like this opportunity to serve my hometown on the bench, to be able to give back to my hometown in this position of service. This is the opportunity that San Francisco has. And if you compare my 13 years of practice to my other two opponents, I believe that I have accomplished more in 13 years. Not only that, if you look at those 13 years and what I've done, ask yourself, what can Daniel Flores do for San Francisco? Because that's my intent. My intent is to add value to the court and potentially be one of your judges for the next 20 plus years. It is the value that you get in your decision when you go to the ballot box. That should be driving what happens, in my humble opinion. It would be my honor to serve you as San Franciscans and to serve you on the bench. For those of you that are lawyers that don't live in San Francisco but who practice here, thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Flores. That concludes our program. I'd like to thank the candidates. I think we're going to get a round of applause. Thank you, Yolanda. My personal thanks to all the candidates. You showed great professionalism and respect for the process, and I thank you for that. I, I also personally respect all of you for having the intestinal fortitude to throw your hats in the ring. I don't think I would have the guts to do it, so my respect to you for doing that. To thank our you, assembled guests, thank you. thank you all for coming. Get out there and vote.